Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, also, we are running several projects in agriculture, water management, and also in satellite image analysis. Today, I think the main idea to invite me is to give you an impression about what is AI, what isn't it, and uh, maybe what you can do with AI. So my talk today is about augmenting intelligence and give you a bit more idea what it is. So first of all, before talking about artificial intelligence, it's important to get an impression about intelligence. So if we look what keeps us up, uh, or our mind up every day, is first of all, rational aspects of intelligence, which is built on learning, understanding, on reasoning, on memorizing. But at the same time, there are also irrational aspects, mainly driven by our emotions. And uh, these two continuously work together in every situation in order to filter out the relevant aspects in our daily perceptions, so waiting, rejection, and filtering, and therefore enhancing our mental models in the brain, maybe changing them. And this is the basis for our consciousness, from our self-understanding, the perception and thinking, and based on this, there are many things going on, what we do every day, analyzing situations, generalizing problems, combining aspects, and therefore act in a certain way intelligent. If you now look to artificial intelligence, this is uh, a somehow only limited, it's only focusing on rational aspects. And one of the grandfathers of AI, Marvin Minsky, already mentioned, which still holds, that AI is the science of building or creating machines doing things that would require intelligence if they are done by human beings. And if you look around, there are lots of aspects already present everywhere. Maybe some of you may remember, is there a pointer inside also? Okay. Maybe not. So what happened in Seoul in March 2016? Not only that I was there, something much more important happened. Someone remembers? No, only two hands. It's, oh, this also works. Thank you. Yeah, well, it was AlphaGo. Yeah, AlphaGo met Lisa Doll, who was known as one of the best players in Go in the world, 4-2-1. And the evening before, I was invited by Eric Smith from Google for a dinner. And at my table, there were lots of important Go players in the world. And you can expect no one expected that AlphaGo will succeed at the end. So all the country in Korea was amazed, laid down what happened. And uh, this is what AI is able to do, and you may have heard about AlphaGo Zero and the next evolution steps, which go step by step forward. Well, what is the reason for that? In the case of AlphaGo as well, um, it's the availability of data. They used 30 million of matches of Go stored in the database to train AlphaGo, and that then let AlphaGo play against its own yeah, to improve, to optimize, to be more excellent. And this data is everywhere. When we started DFKI 30 years ago, there was almost no data for applying any of the AI technologies. But now it's easy to do, and moreover, they have the higher computing power. If you look what NVIDIA did and fortunately succeeded in investing billions, hundreds of billions of dollars into GPU AI computers, you can see that we now have special hardware that is able to process the real amount of data and training. So five years ago, when we trained big data sets, we used 500 times more time than today with the new DGX2, which is recently released. On the other hand, there are new learning techniques, training techniques for deep neural networks. And this is a very important aspect if you go back uh, to the ImageNet competition. This is a public data set. Uh, by Fei-Fei Li, and uh, she opened it up in 2009, and from that time on, researchers in all the world start a competition about classifying what's part of the image. And in 2010, a research group from Toronto developed a new technology, AlexNet, which is oriented on the visual cortex of the brain, 
with eight layers of depths to classify the images. And you can see that there was an improvement. This is the error rate made by the systems beforehand, about 30% improvements. And this was a start initiation so that many groups started to really investigate these deep neural technologies. And you can see how this evolved over time. And you see more and more layers are used. And recently, Google published a paper with several thousands of layers encoding yeah, trillions of different parameters automatically, end to end, for classifying things. And this is the situation, the deeper, the better. And based on that, we can start a journey to see that these technologies are successful not only in gaming, they are also used to understand linguistically, to translate. If you use, for example, Google Translate some years before, it's mainly built on NLP. Now they transform it to deep learning as DeepL. Maybe some of you already know. Very successfully did from the beginning. We were able to analyze, evaluate spatiotemporal data, correlations, find anomalies. We can browse social media. We can identify objects, persons, activities, and so on and so on. So many things are possible. So however, because artificial intelligence has these superhuman capabilities in many areas, it's not, um, it's not the same than human intelligence. What we could do is to make use of the benefits of this technology in order to complement our own cognitive abilities, in order to provide augmented intelligence, which helps us in certain situations to better understand, to better memorize, to really detect things which are unable to detect from our own brain capabilities. And today I selected two areas to give you a kind of idea. First of all, it's about an information butler. A butler who is able to think like you, in some sense. Helping you to associate and to anticipate, mainly because we need someone helping us to remember, not only elderly people. It's the daily business where we have this multitasking craziness, important sickness we have to tackle every day. And I give you a simple example. This is Heiko. He's a knowledge worker like you and me, and he has to deal with many things. One very trivial task would be to invite someone for an event. In this case, Professor Tanigali, a colleague of mine. So what you have to do in such a case, similar to this event, organization may, may be not so complex. However, you have to enter the date into your calendar. You further might use a task management system where you enter all the tasks you spend with the deadlines and you could also collect the data of the participants. You could prepare an agenda, furthermore send an email invitation out and moreover transform maybe the agenda into PDF. So what happens here is you can see that you are working with different applications and the information you are using is finally managed or stored in different containers, which are not combined. So you have email folders, you have your directory, you have your contact management system, your bookmarks, your index, whatever you are using, and everything only comes together in Heiko's mind. If he's not there and he's the only guy, no one knows what's going on. Yeah? So the question is how we can support Heiko in a certain way. Now I go back to Tim Berners-Lee idea of the World Wide Web, which is hard to realize on the web because we have different perceptions of what is meaning. But the semantic web has the idea to provide a unique representations of everything on the web. So although it's hard, you can also use the same technology, transfer it to your own desktop. So in this case, the standard called RDF uses a triple representation, which is subject, predicate, object. And as I told you, it's a standard. And the standard, for example, is following Heiko works for DFKI, subject, predicate, object. You can further continue. DFKI is a research organization. DFKI is located in Kaiserslautern. So always triples, but you can see I'm starting to develop a network. Yeah, of relationships. 
And in order to understand who is Heiko, because Heiko is a very common German name, this standard is making use of URIs. HTTPS, colon, slash, blah, blah, blah. File, colon, slash, blah, blah, blah. This is a Unix syntax which is used for all resources on the web. And so we could use, for example, Heiko's URI from his website to give a representation. And we extend this consideration by just introducing the common categories which we use to organize our information like locations, events, topics, tasks, etc. So coming back to our example, we have the agenda and this is the URI of the agenda, folders, subfolders, etc. And we can start building triples. So this agenda is addressing an event, subject, predicate, object. This agenda is also held at a certain location and fortunately Google Maps also provides a URI. So, and this is a location, subject, predicate, object. There is a participant, Professor Tanigali and another guy, and they are both persons, and they are working for some organizations. Yeah. And uh, Professor Tanigali has an address, and Outlook also provides URI. The same holds for the calendar. So what happens now is, you can see that independent of the application, we are building a meta layer of associative relationships similar to what we have in our mind, thinking about events and locations and persons, organizations, everything could be somehow combined. So I've shown you an example, and I go back to July 2014, where Heiko is now preparing a meeting next day in Istanbul, and he's thinking about what to talk about next day, and he uses a special editor. And this editor is the kind of information butler acting in the backside, what he's doing, and there are several icons on the top. You can see there are persons, groups, locations, software, tools, notes, etc. And there are different things already shown by the system. This is stage to start, and I'm starting a video. And you can see starting to click on this workshop to prepare. There is some metadata and he's opening a semantic wiki to start with making notes. So he's talking about a session about preservation workshop next day, as I told you, in Istanbul. He can edit the things, and while writing in the background, the information butler already identifies known things. So preservation is a topic and is filed in his personal information model. So if he continues writing some questions, how does POF recognize the collection? You can see POF, the acronym, is recognized as something known. And this is a software also stored in his personal information model. And there's a Claudia, and uh, she suggests to have a breakout, and this is great because the system knows more Claudias at the same time, and so how you can specify which Claudia it is. So we can easily then provide this hyperlink, this is nothing else than a hyperlink to the source itself, to the URI. And so receive some semantic index, and uh, as soon as Heiko continues, you can see the entire body of the text is semantically annotated with all known items automatically. He can further uh, complete it. And the interesting aspect is this is not only from his own PMO, this personal information model, but now if you look to Manusman and you look, what is Manusman? There is Freebase. Who of you knows Freebase? Oh, interesting. Anyway, I explain. So, because when Tim Berners-Lee started to announce the semantic web, many people all over the world started to build up triple stores about cities, tourism, history. Even the US started to publish the first census results as triples. Now you can see early birds like uh, Friend of a Friend Network, there's the German dissertation library, and there's DBpedia. Do you know DBpedia? No, it's the semantified version of Wikipedia. There is an RDF version of Wikipedia available to be used by a computer. Could be understood by a computer, easy things. And uh, if you see how it started, it's the same technology that we used at the workspace, and in 2009, there is Freebase. 
This is the source I just showed you. And Freebase is used from 2009 by Google. It contained 300 billion triples generated by the crowd. And it's free, it's open source. So Google used it to develop the Hummingbird search. This is the new search engine where you can find on the right-hand side of your website all these relationships. If you search for Andreas Stengel, you get also a hint. Maybe you're searching for DFKI, for Kaiserslautern, whatever. All this is given and this further evolved. You can see this is the linked open data today immense knowledge all over the world, ready to be used by everyone. It's open data. Yeah. So it's a rich source of explicit knowledge to be used. Coming to my second example. Well, if you look around what's going on, you can see that people are talking about different things in the world over social media. And uh, we are asking ourselves, well, is it possible to get an understanding of what's important to people and maybe also how people feel about it? So we started to investigate into multimedia opinion mining. Multimedia because we are not only looking at text like in Twitter, what are people talking, but moreover on images because it's easy to take an image, send it to someone with an emoticon or some short statement, yeah, that's the kind of messaging of these days. So it's important to get an impression about what is meant by the pictures. And not facts, but about subjective aspects. And the problems here are, if you look at the pictures, what are they showing? You have an idea what's here shown? A gate? Someone sees something different? I'm sure. Yeah, if I would give you paper and write down, it's in different to sell. What is here? Anyway, they are uploaded because time is running as abundant building and as stormy landscape. So it's very hard because they are different understanding of images, right? The same also here in this example, which is based on the initiative of the, the New York Police Department, which asked their citizens, please send us pictures and comments about friendly policemen. What happened is people sent messages like the ones here. Here the New York Police Department engages with its committee members, changing hearts and minds one better at a time. And is that the one your public relations people requested? So is it positive or negative? No idea. Yeah? But if you look to the pictures, you get an idea about the message the sender want to submit. The same holds here if you look to advertisement. Nowadays we have the crawlers, and the crawlers go through the web looking for pictures and videos, and if they find a dog, well, very nice, advertisement. Yeah? But if you look to companies, companies don't want to see their advertisements everywhere because a dog is not a dog. Yeah? Maybe on the left-hand side, it's a more scary guy, and the one here is the cute one. So you would prefer, of course, the right one. Yeah. And this is very important that you have to look into the content more deeply to get an understanding. So what we did here is to develop a visual sentiment ontology, which is trying to take uh, respect of this. So we used the deep learning network and we trained the network with adjective noun pairs. Abundant building, cute, dark, stormy landscape. And this is um, used and at the same time we used uh, some concepts which are linked to emotions which have strong sentiment, which are available in Flick and YouTube and could be reasonably recognized in any image. And based on that, we lent a bipolar emotion model from Blutschik, this so-called Wheel of Emotions, where he asked thousands of people, what feeling do you have respecting a certain color? And based on this input, we made use of the largest image collection in the world. This is composed on 80 millions of pictures and 20 millions of videos. The YFCC common 100 million. And we trained the neural network so that the network could automatically identify what's part of the image. And these are the top five. The most interesting aspect here is that the network behaves like a human because humans have also these different perspectives of what could be part of the image. But the question is also why? 
So we also ask, why is the system classifying this picture that way? So we made some investigations and um, came up to develop methods to identify the responsible pixels in the input image which causes a certain emotion. So we extended the entire network to location orientation and then were able to distinguish between where's the stormy wave, where's the stormy coast, and where's the stormy cloud. And the interesting aspect is if you know this and you combine this technique with your ontology, you could also use it to caption, to form captions of pictures because you can use prepositions and conjunctions, combine different emotions, and then automatically yeah, make an index of your own pictures. Just one idea, since we also use this technology for deep eye system, which is providing a dashboard for disaster management. So we are combining image analysis of different bands of the satellites where we have residential areas, vegetation, already burned areas, and we are analyzing what people communicate via Twitter, so a bird eye view and a grassroot view, and therefore get much better impressions about what's going on ge uh, geographically, temporally, and also emotionally um, on the uh, certain event. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, I think we have some time in the glass house to talk to each other. Thank you.